text today is uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Um, so last time we finished up chapter 1, we looked at the last few verses there, and uh, we, we read how we are to live lives worthy of the gospel, uh, and how there should be this fearless unity uh, among us in the church, uh, knowing that we are called not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. And suffering for Christ often comes to us when people are opposed to the message of the gospel. Thankfully, it's not usually too strong, or too, the suffering's not too intense here usually, but uh, whenever there's opposition to uh, the, the message of the cross, uh, that is a type of suffering, and that's what Paul was referring to, that we are to live uh, lives worthy of, of the gospel and and that involves conflict and this is what paul was in jail for he was in jail for the the sake of christ Um, sinners are opposed to the message of of the gospel uh, until god opens their eyes to the truth of it Uh, so we can expect opposition to the message of of christ and what he's done for sinners and and that's okay that's what we've been when called to do so we cannot expect the kingdom of god uh, to advance without spiritual conflict Uh, we're not talking about physical conflict spreading christianity through the means of the sword uh, but through spiritual uh, conflict and that is through bringing the gospel to the world Uh, and in our text today paul continues with this theme of unity uh, where he explains that True unity within the the body of Christ comes from humility. And the greatest example of that humility is, of course, found in the Lord Jesus himself. So let's read uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit. Another way to translate that is from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The section, chapter 2, begins with the word, so. So that means that there is a thought process here. There's a a flow, there's a a connection between the previous uh, section. Uh, To sum it up, uh, Paul is saying, in essence, since... We are to live lives worthy of the gospel through this fearless unity, through this suffering for Christ. Then, um, if there's any encouragement in Christ, right, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection um, and sympathy. Uh, and he throws the word if in there, but he's not using that word to imply that it might not be true. It's not that kind of if, uh, but it's more use in a rhetorical sense. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, the answer is, and there is, if there's any comfort in love, which there is, if there's any participation in the Spirit, which there is, if there's any affection and sympathy, which there is, then complete my joy. So those things that Paul listed there are 
uh, the motivations, the, the graces the, that God gives us, uh, the encouragement to enable us to obey the command for unity. All of those things uh, listed by Paul are to be real in the believer's life. They're all connected to and flow from the gospel itself. Uh, so Paul is saying, if those things exist in your life, then complete my joy. Make me happy, basically, is what he's saying. But why, why does that matter? Why complete Paul's joy? Shouldn't they be concerned about what makes God happy, completing God's joy, doing God's will more than the Apostle Paul? Well, in this regard, to complete Paul's joy would also be to complete God's joy. Paul's saying if you do these things, if you are unified by being of the same mind and, and love and one accord, that's going to make me happy. That's what he's saying. And since Paul is being used here by the Holy Spirit to pen these words to make Paul happy in this regard, then, then God is happy too. So this unity that Paul wants for the church is exactly what God wants for the church as well. He says, complete my joy, verse 2, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. The first thing he mentions here is being of the same mind. It's a li that's a little bit different than what he says uh, w when he means uh, to be of one mind. It's different, different words there. The Greek phrase being of the same mind has to do primarily with attitude. Some of these nuances we miss in the English translation, but it means really uh, everyone should be on this, have the same kind of attitude uh, towards each other. And we'll dig into what that looks like in a little bit. He says uh, they should have the same love, right? A, a love, obviously, for Christ and love for each other. Love is the, the great unifier of the body of Christ. Without genuine love... Uh, for one another, there cannot be unity. There will only be division. Colossians 3.14 says, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Right? That is, that is the goal here, to, to bring everything together in perfect harmony. And, and Paul unpacks what real love looks like among Christians in the verses that follow. Uh, he, he, he then says they have to be in full accord. Again, the Greek, it's kind of missed in the English. It, it means to be joined in soul. To be joined in soul. Kind of like, you know, a husband and wife might say, or even boyfriend and girlfriend would say, we're soulmates, right? We're, we're made for each other. Because we're just on the same page about everything. And, you know, we're, we're unified. And then they get married and they realize they're not as unified as they thought they were. Um... But they love each other, they're made for each other, they're soulmates, right? So Christians should be joined in soul, united together for, uh, in our love for Christ and for each other. And then he says, be of one mind, right? That's uh, unified in our, in our thinking. This doesn't mean that we uh, never disagree on anything. Um, we're all just a bunch of robots who believe the same thing. We never see anything differently. Um, but... We must all think the same when it comes to the non-negotiable truths of the gospel, the truth of scripture. Those we cannot waver on. We must be on the, have the same mindset. We have to be on the same page when it comes to doctrine, sound doctrine. All right, so, so Paul sets a pretty high bar here when he calls for unity in the church. And if the command to be unified ended here, and that was, that was all we had, it would kind of leave us helpless. It would kind of leave us discouraged. Um, if we weren't so corrupted by sin as we are, then we could probably figure it out uh, naturally, how to have the same attitude, how to uh, love each other, how to be of the same soul and mind. Uh, but because we're not yet free from indwelling sin, and even as Christians... We have a hard time being unified together in love. And so thankfully, because God is good and loving and, and kind, He's shown us in His Word uh, here uh, commands to follow that demonstrate to us what true Christian love and unity looks like. He elaborates beginning in verse 3. 
do nothing from rivalry or selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So do nothing from rivalry or conceit. I was looking at another, I have another ESV Bible and it translates rivalry as selfish ambition. I don't, I'm not sure what you, you have, but it, that's the, the main idea, selfish ambition, right? This Do nothing from those things. So that's a very broad command. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Uh, don't do anything from selfish desire is what he's saying. So to bring unity into the body of Christ... You must not do anything at all to put your needs above the needs of others. Doing what you prefer at the expense of other people. Right? Selfishness always negatively affects someone else. Uh, this doesn't mean that if you do something to benefit yourself at all, you're sinning. Uh, we all do that, right? As Paul mentions in verse 4, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, but if you do something to benefit yourself at the expense of somebody else, that is selfishness and that is sin. You're prioritizing your desires, your needs, your preferences at the expense of others. Uh, it doesn't matter how small a thing might seem to be. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition. Think about that in your everyday life, especially when it comes to your family, with people who you're around the most. Just think about you know, the little things that you do every day where you might not even think selfishness is, is an issue. Uh, all of us uh, as sinners, even Christians, with fighting against that old nature, naturally within us we are selfish, right? Sometimes it's more obvious in others uh, than, than some, or it's in other times in our life, we might be more selfish than other times. Uh, but there's many different ways, many different times where we could be selfish. Um, and we, we do things and we act out of selfish ambition. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. King James translates conceit as vainglory. Right? We don't really use that, that term anymore, but I think that's... Uh, a good translation. The, the idea is the same, right? It's, it's pride, right? It's thinking uh, too highly of yourself, being conceited. So don't think highly of yourself. To, to think highly of yourself is, is completely antithetical to the gospel, right? I know the philosophy of the world is uh, to think highly of yourself, to, to boast about who you are and all these things, but it's, that's totally against the gospel because the reason Christ died is because naturally you and me, we're, we're terrible. We're, we're terrible, horrible people, sinners, right? You're not good. I'm not good. Uh, we're all rotten uh, to the core, right? And that's why Christ came uh, to save you, to save you from yourself. So don't do anything from selfish ambition or from the mindset that you are such a great person, right? If you think like that, you have forgotten the whole foundation of the Gospels, that we're all sinners. And so thinking highly of yourself, being conceited, that, that's one of the main things that contributes to selfishness, to think that I am worthy of, of whatever I'm about to do, and that doesn't matter if it affects you negatively or not, right? So he begins with a negative command, don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit. And then the positive command there is, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. And what does that mean? What does it mean to count others more significant than yourselves? Well, it doesn't mean uh, to just pretend that others are uh, maybe better at uh, a skill than you, when in reality, they're not. Like, I'm not going to pretend that my wife's a better guitar player than me, because she's not. And I'm a mediocre guitar player, but she's not better than me because she doesn't play guitar. I'm not going to have false humility and say, oh, she's so much better than me. Um, it's not an insult, it's just 
the reality. We don't, we're not going to be fake here and, and have false humility. That's really not any better, right? It's not truthful. I like uh, John Piper describes uh, what this means uh, to count others more sig significant than yourselves. Uh, I like his definition. He says, it means to count others as worthy to be served. You count others as worthy to be served. Uh, so when you count others as worthy to be served, you're truly humbling yourself. If a king has someone who serves him, uh, the servant views the king as someone who's worthy to be served. Right? He is the, he is the king. I'm you know, the servant. I will serve him. He's worthy of it. We're to have that kind of mindset. Not that we treat everybody as a king, uh, but that we view them as uh, worthy to be served. To count a person more significant than myself is to acknowledge that that person is not beneath me and I am not better than them. They are my brother or sister in Christ. They've been saved by the same uh, grace of God. They've been saved by the same Savior as I have. Christ humbled himself for their sake and for mine, and I must do the same. Now, how do we do this? Verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. One of the basic foundational principles of life, especially when it comes to economics and when you study like markets and free markets and things like that, is that, and this is one of the reasons why communism does not work, everyone looks to their own self-interest, their own interests. And that's not a bad thing in and of itself, although it can become bad if you are selfish, right? Uh, for example, if you need to buy a car and the car is only worth $5,000, but the salesman's trying to sell it to you for $10,000, well, if you're a Christian, shouldn't you just pay the $10,000 because that, you're humbling yourself and that would benefit the, the car salesman? Of course not. Why? Because it doesn't benefit you. It's negatively impacting you, right? So you're, you're, you're looking after your own interests. Now, if you're selfish, you bring selfishness into the negotiations, you're going to haggle the salesman and try to get him to sell to you at cost so he makes nothing. And that's not right either, right? So it's not wrong to look out for your own interests, for your own benefits, but it is wrong if that's the only thing you look to. Right? Paul says not to look to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Uh, you should not be making any decisions in life where you are the only one uh, you care about benefiting, right? That is selfishness. God hates that, and that causes division within the body of Christ. James chapter 4, uh, it says, What causes quarrels and, and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions, your lusts, are at war within you? That's your desires, right? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Selfishness causes quarrels, causes divisions in the body of Christ. If everyone would look to not only their own interests, but also the interests of others, there would be peace, there would be unity in every local church. If everyone did that right now and if the Russians and the Ukrainians both did that, there would be peace. The whole world did that. It would be world peace. We don't expect that, right, from, from unbelieving people, but we must expect it from the church. There would be peace in every local church. There would be no more church splits. Uh, people would never leave on bad terms. Uh, humility is a powerful tool that unites the people of God, and it strengthens the church. So true humility, just like love, is not just a feeling, it's not just a mindset, although that's part of it, it's one of the elements. A truly humble person is a person who looks not only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others in a very practical, everyday way. So every decision you make, big or small, should not have you at the center of it. You should be always considering how, how this will affect other people, positively, or negatively. Now, in verses 5 to 11, the Apostle Paul now 
uh, points us to Jesus himself. Uh, and it's believed that verses 6 to 11 was a hymn that early Christians used to sing. Uh, so let's read verse 5. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Another way to translate that would be, have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, so regardless of the translation details, the idea is the same, and that is Jesus himself is our example of true humility. Have this mind among yourselves. All of you, uh, all of us are to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ in his humility. Can you imagine if we all did that? Well, by God's grace, and if you're a Christian, and you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you, we all can and we all should. Uh, there is no one who lived a, a truly humble life like Christ. Uh, you cannot find a better person to emulate than Jesus. And, and please know that you can't do that in your own strength. You can't become like Christ in, in your own uh, flesh. You can't just begin to just turn over a new leaf and, and, and try to be like the perfect Son of God. You have to be born again. You have to repent of your sin and, and trust in the Lord Jesus to believe the gospel. You have to trust in the finished work of Christ alone for your salvation and not your own good works. You're going to have no power uh, to be like Christ on your own. You need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because without Him, you cannot truly be Christ-like. Now, in verses 6 and following, we see uh, a description of the humility of Christ. This is the, this is the humility we are to strive for. For this is the standard, okay? Let's look at verse 6. He says, Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So Jesus, as I trust you know and believe, was fully God, fully man, yet many, in many ways he lived his life as if he was only the latter, as if he was only a man. In other words, Jesus had the right to have everyone treat him and respect him as God when he was on earth. But for the sake of humility, he put that right aside. So Jesus had every right to kick Herod off the throne and to sit there and make everyone do his bidding, right? But he didn't. Instead, he was born in a manger. And after he began his ministry, he didn't even have a place to lay his head. Jesus had the right to demand that his disciples wash his feet after every step he took, but he didn't. Instead, he washed their feet. Right? Jesus had every right to destroy the Jews and the Romans who crucified him, but he didn't. Instead, he died for them. He was in the form of God, but he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He did not live as though he was equal with God, even though he had every right to do so. Instead, what did he do? He made himself nothing, verse 7. Taking the form of a servant, that word is slave, doulos, it means slave, being born in the likeness of men. Think about the gravity of this. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, eternally existing, who literally created everything, became nothing. He was in the form of God, but he took on the form of a slave, humbled himself, came to earth, and obeyed the Father perfectly. God, the creator of men, was then himself born in the likeness of men, became a helpless baby. As we read in Isaiah 53, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was just an ordinary guy, a carpenter from a podunk town in Israel. And this humility of Christ, humbling himself to the point where he's not just like an ordinary man, actually he takes on the form of a slave, even though he wasn't officially 
you know, regarded by society as a slave, he took on that form. He took on the lowest class of human beings that there were at the time. You couldn't get any lower. He lived like a slave, a slave to the Father's will, obeying him no matter the cost. And as if humbling himself to become a man and a slave wasn't humble enough, look at what else he did. Verse 8, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So the reason why Jesus humbled himself and took on human form was so that he could go even lower and so that he could die, so that God himself could, would die. He obeyed his father just like a slave obeys his master to the point of dying on a cross. So you can't get more humble than that. And what's more, he died via Roman crucifixion, a type of execution reserved for the worst of criminals. Slow, torturous, and utterly humiliating. He didn't just die in his sleep. The Son of Man took on flesh, took on the form of a man, the form of a slave, and he hung beaten, naked, and nailed to a tree so that he could save you. And on that tree, the wrath of his very own Father was poured out upon him for your sin. You cannot find anyone who's more humble than Jesus, the Son of God, dying for his people. And when you look at the humility of Christ, how God became nothing, and how he died the death we deserve to die on the cross under God's wrath, is it, is it really too much to look not only to our own interests, but the interests of others? Is that too much to ask? If you want to know what it looks like to not look to your own interests, but also the interests of others, you have to look at the cross. Look at the cross of Christ. Jesus died on the cross, not out of his own self-interest. He went to the cross first and foremost out of his father's interests. Remember when he prayed in the garden for God to remove the cup from him. Right? And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He, he wanted the best uh, he, he, he did this for the, the Father's interest, the best interest of the Father. And secondly, he died on the cross because it was in your best interest. You benefited from the cross. Jesus did not have any earthly gain from his substitutionary death. Yes, he, he purchased the people for himself, but he didn't have to do that. He was perfectly happy existing eternally within the Godhead. But it was the will of the Father to crush His Son and to save the souls of men. And so He did it. Jesus went to the cross because He was looking to the interests of others. He was looking to the interests of His Father and you. And when you think about the depths of the love and the humility of Christ, how easy it seems to be that we should no longer then look to our own interests, but to the interests of others. If Christ laid down his life for us, how much more should we inconvenience ourselves for the sake of others? C.T. Studd, a, a preacher from the, uh, about a hundred years ago in England, he said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Amen. Humility is a sacrifice that we all should joyfully make for one another because that's what Christ has done for us to the utmost degree. And Paul doesn't end here either. It's not just uh, Christ was humble and that's it. What happened? What was the result of his humility? What was the fruit of it? It is, uh, it is a glorious uh, result. If you look at the rest of the chapter, verses 9 to 11, Therefore, because of this, because of his humility, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ's humiliation resulted in his exaltation. So because Christ was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, 
He rose from the dead and he's seated now at the right hand of the Father where he's ruling and reigning. And because of his humility, God exalted him to the highest place. For his name, the name of Jesus, is above every name. He's greater than any prophet or any man that's ever lived. That is the result of his humiliation. He became nothing, but now he is everything. And one day every person will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is far better to bow the knee to him here in this life than to be forced to do it in the next life on the day of judgment. Because one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee and every tongue, every person that's ever been created will acknowledge the Lordship of Christ, whether they follow him or not. That is how exalted the name of Jesus is. It seems like it's, his name is not exalted now because people rebel against him. They use his name as a curse word. But one day they're going to confess that he is Lord. That's how exalted he is. He says it's going to happen in heaven. Or that's the followers of Christ, obviously, that are in heaven are going to acknowledge the Lordship of Christ and the angels as well. Those on earth, those who are here perhaps at his return right they're going to confess jesus as lord when they see him coming and those he says who are under the earth i think that's a reference to the, the spiritual realm if you recall back uh, when we studied first peter chapter three peter talks about baptism and, and he mentions how uh, jesus proclaimed uh, victory basically to the spirits in prison i believe that's uh, what happened when Jesus was buried, when he was in the grave, he went down there uh, to this place uh, where there were spiritual beings, uh, the spiritual beings who rebelled against God in the days of Noah, right? Uh, they were there being imprisoned, and he proclaimed his victory to them. So Paul's saying that every person, every spiritual being, will one day declare the lordship of Christ to the glory of God. That is what the humility of Christ Produced. His humiliation resulted in his exaltation. So if the humility of Christ produced exaltation, what will be the result of our humility? Anything? We just, that's it, we just live humbly and then that's it? Well, there's, there's fruit, there's, there's results from it as well. Rewards, you could say, too. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs... Heirs of God. If you're a child of God, you're an heir of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer, that's the humility, we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. 2 Timothy 2.12, Paul says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. All right, so you're, you're dying to self, this humiliation will result in one day you being exalted to reign with Christ. So true Christian humility produces two things. It produces unity in the body of Christ. That's the here and the now. And it also brings exaltation with Christ, which comes later. So Christian humility which emulates the life of Christ by counting others more significant than yourselves and looking not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others as well, it is a very powerful thing. It's not easy. It can be unpleasant <clears throat> at times. It can be uncomfortable. But it will lead to God being glorified through love and unity in the church, which will ultimately one day result in you being exalted to reign with Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would teach us to be like your son, Jesus. May we always have the cross before us. May we always look to the humility of Christ as our perfect example to follow. Lord, help us to love each other May we not look out for our own interests, but also to the interests of others, just like you did. Help us, Lord. Give us the grace to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll close with a hymn.